afternoon. We can get started. Um, the assignments, make sure you check out any homework assignments. Um, there's basically going to be one due every uh, end of every week for the next uh, couple weeks. So we're getting close to the end of the semester. A couple major topics to cover still. Uh, right now we're working on methods. So I've got some different uh, ways to look at those today. And then we'll probably get into a raise, start into a raise today, and and um, that might take a couple class periods to go through. So we'll talk about arrays, um, and then we'll talk about file processing, and then some kind of other miscellaneous topics towards the end. So um, any questions on anything so far, kind of broad, broadly? Or if you have uh, individual questions, we could probably go over them in lab. But um, OK. So I'll just keep going. Um, definitely stop me. Some of these topics, you know, they might, you might not, I might go through it too fast or something like that. If I do, feel free to slow me down and, or I'll go back over something if something's not clear because, um, you know, they are a little more difficult to understand so I can understand if, if I'd have to kind of stop and go back over something. So. so I'm just going to kind of drive through, um, go through a couple of these programs that I have that are on Angel. And just to review real quick, the last time we looked at this program, and we talked about methods. And methods are basically functions. Sometimes they're called in languages. Sometimes they're called subroutines. But basically, they do something over and over. Um, they can be passed. They can have data passed into them. They can send data back out. So this example we went over the other day, we went through how to call a method and pass in a parameter or, or an argument. So that's a piece of data or a, a variable that's in our method. <coughs> and then we can get what's called a return value back from the method. So I, <coughs> excuse me, if I keep this all on one page here, the what is this called up here when I do this? Or this part mainly? What am I doing? Um, maybe three words. Calling the, method. Calling, calling the method, right. So you're calling the method up here. And then what is this called here, this kind of general setup statement here? It's a one word term that starts with an H. You're kind of telling the, the language what your method looks like. Heading. What's that? Heading. Header. Method header. Uh -huh. So it's uh, it defines what this is. So ignoring the private, all of ours are going to be private. Um, other options for this we'll get into, or you'll get into if you took the advanced course. But as far as the rest of it goes, uh, this is the method name. And then what is this right here doing? What is it doing or what's it called? Or both. Anybody? Is that uh, data that's turned back returned to us from what the method <coughs> ends up doing? I mean, it's the information you're going to put in. Right, so it's the parameters, the arguments. It's the input to the method in this case. So it's parameters, arguments is the kind of common term. There's only one here, but we'll look at how to do several. Now what's this called here? What is this for? Return type. Return type. So what does that mean? I'm sorry. Like you're going to be dealing with an integer. So dealing with it meaning you're going to like what you put in is going to be an integer. That's the data type. It's a data type, but it's for something specific. Some specific part of the job of a method. <laughs> so these are generally 
inputs. So that's what the output's going to be? Right. So this is the, re the data type of the return value, if you have one. So I'm going to return a variable down here. And somehow I calculated a, a tier number, and I return that. This variable here has to be an int, because that's what I put here. So these have to match up. So review is good. <coughs> um, sorry for the scrolling here. So that was this method. So I called it from here. I passed in a number of hits that was known to my click event. The method runs, and then it returns the tier number, the integer, back into this variable, which is known to my click event. Now I have this method to calculate salary. It's also taking in an input. It's passing a variable from my click event down into the method. So let's see here. So my method calculates salary. It's down here. It's a different method header. So it has a different name, a different number of, well, has the same kind of data coming in. Keep in mind, these are two different methods that have these two different um, parameter or two parameters. Even though they're named the same, these are not the same variable. So they're not um, they're not fields. They're not globally available. They're only available to this method. So anything you declare in the parentheses and the header is only available to the method. Then this one does its own thing. And it comes back with a salary. And because the salary is a decimal type, I had to have decimal up here on the left. It doesn't matter what we have between the parentheses if it's integer or not. Say that again? It doesn't matter. I mean, I thought that the decimal and whatever between the parentheses should match, or that doesn't matter. You mean this and this? Mm -hmm. No, it's not required. They're two different things, really. Like this is passing data in, and you're going to use that. And then this is what's going back out through the return statement. And it could be one could be a string, one could be an integer. Yeah. So there, the first one we had, they happened to match, but I wanted to make sure I showed you one that where they didn't. So that's a good question. So this one looks, you know, pretty much the same. It's doing a different job, and then it returns back a decimal, which is the salary. So all the all the variable names you see here are local to this click event. So keep that in mind. So the variable names I use here are local to the click event. Any variable name I use here in the method header is local to this method along with anything that's I declare within the method. So these are all only available to this method. Which is good. You want to write code that as much as possible it keeps variables kind of confined to the method they're dealing with. If you need to share data across multiple methods then you need to create a field. Could you close the door please? Yeah, do we have any kind of sandwich? No, not today. <clears throat> so keep that in mind about variables, where they're at, where they're declared, where they're available to. So I can't, this local base salary per hit, I can't use that in any other method besides this. I can't reference it. When you, when you specify a variable name here, you say it's data type mm -hmm. and it's name. 
this name is local to this method, and that's basically declaring it. And you're also saying that whoever or whatever calls it is going to pass you that data in. It needs to send that data down. So yeah, it's kind of doing two things at once. These here are local, but they're not passed in. We're going to calculate them within the method, so we don't have to, we don't put them up here. So you kind of do as little as possible in these parameters. You only take in things that you need. The rest of it you can kind of use through normal coding. So this code that's in here isn't really that much different than code we might have had before to calculate salary. And we probably, you know, we formally would have had that all up here. So this is cleaning up our code a little bit, making it a little easier to read. But we still have logic within the click event. We're just utilizing a method. So that was a method where we have one parameter going in, and then it does its job, and then it returns one return code coming back. So the right side basically runs, then the left side gets populated with a return value. So does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to move on to a uh, different example, but slightly similar. So this, uh, this approach is commonly used uh, where you have a return value, one return value, and you have that coming back. Sometimes you need to return more than one value, so this, this approach is kind of limiting in that respect. So we need a way to pass back more data. And one way you can do that is to pass, instead of using return code, you can have what are called out, out parameters. This is basically an in, param or an in parameter or an in argument input. So I'm going to bring up a different example to show you that. And the rest of the code in that example was something we, was things we've already seen. So. What I'm trying to focus on is just what's changed. So this one works the same, but internally I changed a few things. And I have some comments here if you're looking at it later and you want to know what I'm talking about. All right, on this one, I'll try and expand it a little bit. So on the prior one, we had two different steps that were basically taking the same input and they were coming back with two different answers. So we took a number of hits and we figured out what's their tier number. We took a number of hits and we figured out what's their salary. So if we want to do that kind of all in one step, what I'm going to show you here is a single method that does both, the job of both, and it further helps us in this case consolidate our code. If I go back to the other example, just to show you for a second, can't really show it all here at <coughs> once. But in both methods, they both had this if structure and these else's. And they, that structure was basically the same in the two different methods. <coughs> so anytime you're doing that, you want to further, if you can, further consolidate that so you don't have to repeat this kind of coding twice. And the only difference was one was coming back with a salary and one was coming back with a tier. Other than that, these kind of ifs were the same. So in this case, since we have that, what I want to do is consolidate these two methods that, base, that have some of the same structure into one method that, that calculates both a tier number and it calculates a salary. So if we go to this other example, I'll show you what the method call looks like. So we used to have two method calls in the other one. One, you know, we used to have one here and one, two, two in this slot. One was determining the tier, one was determining the salary. And then they had things on the left as well. 
this one's different. You'll notice one of the first things you'll notice is that it doesn't have anything on the left. There's no something equals whatever. We'll come back to that. But basically, we're not going to use that return anymore, or not anymore, but for this example, we're not going to use the return. So we don't have anything on the left to, to come back. So again, this is the code where the click event occurs. So I click on calculating a player's salary. I do my normal validation kind of steps. And I say, OK, now I have a hit count. I want another tier number, and I want another salary. The other thing you'll notice is this one in the parentheses has a few more things going on than the last example. The last example just had a player hit count, and that was it. This example, we have a couple additional parameters or arguments. And you'll notice they both have out in front of them. What this means is uh, if it doesn't have out in front of it, it's basically going into the method, and it's, it's not going to be changed. If it has an out in front of it, the method will basically give us data back in this variable that the method has changed. So these are basically being updated. So out means the method can output it. Um, so you have out in front of the, the variable name. All these names here are local to the click event. So they're generally going to be different names than the method's going to use for those. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying I'm going to give you a number of hits, and the method's going to tell me what's the tier number and what's their salary. So if I can get this all in the same, yeah. For the most part, I can show you at least the starting point. So here's my method. Determine tier and calc salary, which is right down here as well. Since we were just talking about the parameters, let's look over here. I'm going to scroll it over. Well, I'll just put this on the next line. You can put code across lines like this. It does the same thing, it's just you have to read across two lines. So here's my method. Here's the call to the method up here. Here's my method header. So in this case, I'm saying when someone calls this method, they need to pass me a number of hits as an integer. Then down here, we're going to see this out again. Then the data type of the parameter and then the name that you're going to use within the method for that data. So these are different variable names, and I just made them with some prefix here so you can kind of see in and out. But basically I'm getting a number of hits in, and I'm going to send back out a tier number and a salary. So when you're, when you're first creating a method, it's, it's usually something uh, pretty quick to just give it a name set up the parentheses, then figure out, okay, what's coming into it. So usually the inputs come first. They don't have to. But in this case, I'm going to have inputs, an input first, and then an output from the methods, second and third. So everything's positional. So when I call it up here, number of hits, a tier number, a salary. Down here, it's number of hits, tier number, salary. So. Generally, just think of things that way that they have to be, you have to pass things in the same order that you set up the header with. There's other ways to go around that, but uh, we won't get into that today. So, so this is one parameter in, two coming out. And you can also see that in the method header, one in, and then two with the outs on it. And the two outs are different data types. So one's an integer and the other is a decimal, and that's allowed. So the out means that this method can update the variable. If you don't have the out, this method will not be able to change uh, to update the variable or to send it back out. So 
So let's say we called the method and we sent in 300. So, and we said 300 comma whatever the tier number out, whatever the tier number is up there, out, whatever the salary is up in the, in the call. But the main thing is we passed in 300. So we've got a, so now we're into our method which goes in between these braces here. So let me see. This is most of the code of the method, but it goes from here down to a little below the line here. Remember, this is the variable, and this is the one coming in, and we're going to use it in this method. These are the ones going out, and these are the names we're going to use in the method. So I take my input hits, which is this, and I see if it's where, where 300 falls, which is down here, less than or equal to 300. Now I say my tier number locally is 4, it's a tier 4 salary, and my salary is whatever the constant is, I don't know, $20,000 or whatever it is per hit. These are just locals. They're getting set um, just like we would do any other code, you know, through some variables that are available. This constant's a field, so it's available. I didn't declare it here, but it's available to the method. So now the last thing I do, I think it's the last thing, yeah. So the method ends after these two lines of code. The last thing I do in this method is I set my out parameters. So these two here. This one, my tier number. I set it right here to be whatever the local was. Now this code, you know, kind of makes, breaks things up a little bit. You probably could have just use this out up in these different steps instead of the local. I just want to show you how it would be if you had a local and then you put the local into the output. So I find out I have 300 hits. I hit this else. This tier number is set to 4. The salary is set to just say 20,000. Then I, I'm done with the if structure. And I come down here. The last step is instead of using a return whatever, I need to pass two things back. So I say the out parameter, so this one, the first one, the integer of the tier number, I'm going to set that to whatever's in my tier number, which is 4. And then the salary, I'm going to say it's the number of hits that came in times this $20,000, let's say. I'm going to put that in my salary out right here. So the inputs used to kind of evaluate things, the outputs are kind of like two returns, but they're not returns. They're output parameters. So this allows you to return more than one uh, type of data. It allows you to return more than one variable, return more than one answer, whatever you want to say, from a method and there's really no limit. So I could have 10, 10 parameters here, five could be input, five could be output. So it's, it's kind of whatever you need to happen, you can do. Um, and this code could be you know, 10 pages long, whatever it's doing. It just happens to be a, a screen full of code here. So does that make sense as far as the mechanics of what's going on here? Uh -huh. So if I wanted to pass in three variables, I would just, when initially following it, just put them in the order I want them passed in, like it just follows the order? Yes. Okay. Are you saying um, three input? Yeah, if I had like three input variables, it just follows the order, basically. Yes. So if I did that, I'd have to add additional variables here. So whatever we call it, input to... Uh, I'll just say string input three. So we would do something like that. If you had two more inputs, you'd do something like that. 
now it's giving me an error because the one that called it is um, only has has three three parameters and now I have five. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of this. So everything has to match up. That's why C sharp is a good language. It, you know, it might seem like a pain sometimes where it won't let you do certain things, but that's a good thing because in this case it's gonna check for you right now if things match up. So an integer has to be going into an integer. Um, an integer has to be output into an integer. A decimal has to be sent back to a decimal. So everything has to match up. The number of parameters has to match up. So it has to be three down here. They're separated by commas. They're all inside these parentheses. These are powerful um, tools, methods. Every language has them. You just usually have to figure out how other languages format the, the parameters and how that works. Some languages are pretty loose as far as um, data types and things like that. So some languages don't require you to declare integers and decimals. It just kind of you just kind of send data around, but you can also get into trouble with that where you know you might try and multiply a string times an integer and String data doesn't really multiply. So, yes? If I wanted to send like, a decimal to the integer one, can I cast it while putting in the method, or does it have to be cast beforehand and then put in the method? Like, could I put like parentheses integer before player hit count if player hit count was a decimal? So, if for example this was decimal? Yeah, and, and so could I cast it right there when I'm calling the method, or do I have to do it before? So this, remember this is casting, so we're kind of combining some things we learned before, which is, if this is an integer, the method header is the boss. So whatever you say here is what has to be passed in. So if I said decimal, then I need to pass in a decimal. So remember, if we have an integer variable, which is what this is, we have to turn it into a decimal, and one way to do that is to put the decimal in front of it, that's called casting. So that's a little diversion there. But um, the types have to be adhered to whatever you declare down here, so I'm going to change it back to what I had. So just keep that in mind. All right, so with this method, the other thing that's different about it is it has nothing on the left. So there's no return code. So the last example we went over before, down here in the, at the bottom, it said return something. Return the tier number in one of them, return the salary in another. We're not really using that, so we don't need to use the return. Return or return with a variable name. Because we hit the end of the method, and we basically did two returns. I mean, they're not called returns, but we basically set two variables as output to whatever the answer was. So again, think of a method as somebody asking you a question. So the caller is saying, what's, uh, what's this player's salary and tier? And the answering or the method goes through and figures that out and it sends it back. So it's like a conversation. Generally, it's one call, one answer, but the answer can have multiple uh, pieces to it, and the question can have multiple parts to it. So if you want to think about it that way, that's another way to think about methods. Uh, as you're building it, like anything, you can build it kind of incrementally. So the first thing in this example, you know, it's kind of good to talk about how you would do code, how you would create code if you had to do this. So I might say, 
create a method that calculates um, salary and tier based on the number of hits. So you could go right at it and say, okay, well, I know number of hits drives both, so that's an input parameter, and then set up these, or you could just kind of get the input part working. So you could just set up a method with just, like we did before, with just one parameter going in, and get your calculation working, and use a return. So all these things that we're talking about aren't that far apart. It's just, you know, building it, and I wouldn't try and do it all at once. So you could set up your method header, um, and go through with that. But anyway, going back to the return code, so up here where I called the method, there was no XYZ equals this method. That's because there's no return code being used in this case. So down here I don't have a return. And when you have that situation, there's this uh, term in the language called void. It's kind of like null. It basically means that you're not going to return anything through the return. So instead of this being in decimal, string, whatever, this is void, and void just means you're not going to return through the return. So if down here I try to say uh, return, let's say this variable, I should get a, a warning or an error from C sharp, but let's see. Returns, so it says, you know, whatever your method name is returns void, the return keyword must not be followed by an object. So, kind of tells me, but not exactly. But basically, this return isn't valid because I said I'm not going to return anything. So normally, you know, not normally, but um, you can return things through the return code only. You can return data through these outs. You can also do both. So is everybody good with how I turned those other two methods into this one? One method call, no return value on the left, two output parameters on the right, and one input parameter. Does anybody have any questions on that, how that's working? Now let's just say I wanted to return a, I don't know, true-false to say that everything was successful. So what I could do, the first thing I would want to do is set the data type up here. So if I use true-false or yes-no kind of thing, what kind of, what's a data type for that? Boolean. So up here I could put... Um, so I'm going to say bool, and then down here I'm going to say, oops, I'm not going to add a lot of code to make it actually return two different values, but um, I'll just say return true. So this return, so if I add this return and I say return true or return false, I'd probably have some other logic in reality. But just to show you, now I say return true and I have this bool that I'm able to return a value or a along with I can still have my outs. So you can have a combination. You can have just use of return to send data back. You can have just out parameters or you could use both. So I just wanted to show that example. So I'm going to change it back to a void. And then, what was the other thing? I th think you remember, but we talked about this before. These names, 
do not match the ones on the method header. And generally, you want to keep them different because they're two different variables, really. So these names are known to the click event. These names are only known to the method, even though they share data. And the only way a name, a parameter up here, can get changed is if you put the out on the front of it. Now, if you think about triparse for a minute, which I have an example up here, triparse is a what? What is it? Uh, is it a object? Is it a class? Is it a property? Is it a method? It's a method. So triparse is a method that Microsoft wrote for us for every data type. So somebody wrote some code that we can't see, but we can use it. And we run a try parse, what does it do? Or how's it formatted? What's the first thing that we give it? The input and the output. Right. We give it input of text. And normally we've been sending like our text property of a, a form on the field that someone typed in. But we could we could pass any kind of string data there. <coughs> so it basically has to be some string data, comma, and then we say out some variable that we want to receive the numeric equivalent of the text. So try parse is a method that Microsoft set up. They wrote the code for it. Probably doesn't have many lines of code. And it basically does something to turn our text into a, an output of how many hits they had in this case. And we can pass, we can use try parse 20 times if we want to in the code. And it's calling the same method with different data. So on that one program where we had like uh, to do things for like compare two cars, you, I don't think I had you do this, but I could have had you parse every field. Um, in that case, you would have called try parse, you know, maybe five <coughs> times. So there's, I wouldn't say there's any magic going on here now that we know what a method does. So you can write a method, and it can be used by many programs and it basically does whatever it's supposed to do. Generally methods, you know, at, at larger companies and even smaller companies, if there's you know a couple programmers or more in a department, methods are usually written by probably the more experienced programmers. And then all the other programmers would use the, those methods because what you want to try and do is avoid for complicated code you want to avoid you know ten people coding it ten different ways. Some companies code it 10 different ways and don't think about this. So it just depends on um, you know, what you're doing. And it becomes hard to maintain if you keep things, um, if you have 10 different ways or 10 different people writing code for 10 different things for the same thing. So try parse is a method. And on the left of try parse, it returns us a true false, right, to tell us if it succeeded or not. So try parse has one parameter going in, one parameter coming back out, and it also has a return code. So it's kind of giving us two pieces of information. And that's just the way they created it, the way Microsoft created it. If we say um, clear a field on the form or uh, make the focus of a field, if you remember, I don't think I have any examples in here, but it's like field name dot focus with parentheses around it. That's a method. So it's somebody wrote some code. In that case, it's Microsoft's code that figured out how to get the cursor to go up into the first name field or whatever it is. Believe it or not, there's probably you know a good couple pages of code just to do that. There's a lot going on that you know we take for granted in some of these things that. Um, especially in these routines that that come with us. Two string, for example, that's a method. So we take one of our fields, it's decimal, and we say dot two string. So a method has something to do, it does something for you. So it's like you saying, I've got this number, and you ask someone else to write down what it would look like with the dollar sign and commas and decimal and all that kind of stuff. Or 
concurrency format. So two strings of method Microsoft wrote. It takes in a parameter. In this case, we didn't send a variable. We put the letter C in quotes. That's still an input. And this returns. So the method runs, and it returns us text. And we put it into something else. So I'm just showing you other things, our methods besides. We originally just used methods that Microsoft wrote. Now we can write our own, and that should give us a little power to do things and to manage our code. So do you see how this one's different and how it's working different than the other one that was a return value? So the hardest part on these is usually figuring out the parameters, um, the types, and then probably writing the code for the method. But once you have it working, you should be able to call this method. If I needed to, let's say I had a, a monthly program that calculated uh, salaries for all the players. That might be a process, they call a batch process. It might be a process like payroll that might go through all the employees for a given pay date and go and figure out their salary and print the checks or whatever. Right now we just have, we're just kind of showing one player at a time salaries. But if you had a process that calculated salary for all players and you had this method already created, what could you do? What could you do with this method? So if you have um, 30 players on a roster and you need to print checks, and make sure you have money in the bank for millions of dollars. How would you, what could you do with this method? We're just calling it once, but what could you do with that? Yeah, you could call it 30 times. You could have it inside of a what? Probably a loop. So you might have a file of, or a database of um, hits, or you might have the stats for the season somewhere, and you could go say, okay, what's this player's hits for whatever time period. Call the method, get the next player's hits, call the method, get the salary, show it on a report, print it on a check, whatever. So that's what methods are good for as well, to do the same thing over and over consistently. So if there's some kind of problem with someone's salary, you don't have to go look in 10 different places to see how this programmer coded it versus this programmer. You should be able to go to one place for common functions and look at it and say, oh, we forgot to adjust, you know, the you know, up to 400 hits now is this tier, or maybe we needed a new tier, so we added another else if, or something like that. So, so just to kind of give you an understanding of where they're, they're useful, and things like that. So from here, you know, any example, you just have to think of mainly what are the inputs, what's the input or input parameters, what are the outs, or what's the return value, and kind of get that all set up, and then you can start writing the code. If you need any other local variables that you don't really need to be passed into you or to be passed out, then you can just set up these locals within the method, and these are discarded. As soon as the method's done, these are lost, because we don't need them anymore. They're just temporary for the one calculation. Anything that's permanent, you need to send back in and out. Like I said, there's no limit. Um, there might be a limit, but it's probably in the hundreds of how many parameters you could have here. Okay, so does that make sense? Any questions on different types or of methods or ways of working with them. Okay. So in lab today, I'm going to go through a couple things with arrays, but in lab today, I'm going to have a quiz where you download some code and you look at it and you figure out how to get it working and it uses methods. So you have to kind of you're not writing a lot of code, you're more figuring it out. That's what I have to do sometimes when I get homework assignments. I have to figure out why it's not work why yours isn't working and try and help you out. So it's very close, really related to what we've gone over.
Let me do uh, one thing to introduce our raise, and then we'll head down to land. All right, so shifting gears a little bit. I did a uh, diagram, and I'll put this on Angel in the course resources folder. But um, so far, so we're kind of, I'm done talking about methods. If you want to talk about it anymore, make sure you email me or something like that. Um, and there will be a homework on methods coming up. So I'm kind of shifting gears to arrays, uh, which are independent of methods, don't necessarily have anything to do with methods. So it's kind of a different thought process. So today I just want to kind of introduce it so you can think about it, and then next time I'll go through some examples. But if you think about it so far, whenever we've declared variables, we pretty much have one value. So we would say something like <coughs> int whatever, some variable, and set it to one value. So if you think about memory, what's going on is you basically have one box in memory and it holds that value of whatever you set it equal to. It. If you change it, it changes that one box in memory. Well, arrays are different. They're more complex structures, but they kind of do the same thing, just multiple times. So um, an array, we'll look at some code, but basically you set it up. The decla declaration of an array looks a little different. Um, instead of just int, you say int, and you have an open and closed uh, square bracket. And then you say some name. Usually it's good to put the word array somewhere in your name so you know it's different. But that's your name. And then this is just some syntax. But basically, this is declaring an array of five integers. What that means is what I tried to diagram over here. So instead of, like this has one value sitting in a box of memory, what an array does behind the scenes is it sets up like five values because I said make it size five. It sets up five boxes for me of integers. And these are just sample values. Don't, there's no meaning in these numbers I have here. I'm just showing you. Um, I have five different values in an array. And each of them can be referenced by this name here. But we have to give a little more information than that. We can't just say my whatever hit count equals 33. We can't do that. We have to tell it which one of these boxes we want to be filled in. See with me so far? So what you have to do is um, you refer to an offset or an index, it's called sometimes, um, subscript. Basically, each slot has a number. And what's weird about arrays, or initially is weird, a lot of languages do this, is the first slot is not called 1, it's slot 0. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, is, holds 5 values. So if you say integer array size 5, you're going to have slots 0 through 4. And what you do is when you refer to, when you want to assign a value to this variable, to, um, what's my example here? If you want to say what's in slot 4, you say whatever your variable name is, or whatever your, this name here, it's the same thing. And then you put in square brackets, you want the slot 4. So you say 4. So if you say that variable name, 4, what you're asking for is slot 4 of this, of these five values, I'm sorry, it's the fifth slot here to us, if we never done 1 through 5, but to the computer, it's index or offset 4. So with arrays, part of what's, you know, hard to think about at first is this base 0 numbering. But a lot of things in computers work like that, where they use a base 0 instead of 1. So that's one thing to try and remember. The other thing is just you know, declaring it's a little different. So really, you just kind of have to, every once in a while, even I, when I declare these, I have to remember, OK, what goes where and what gets set up. I have to, usually have to refer back to, to another piece of code. But once you 
you kind of get familiar with that, it's really the same thing. It's a variable name, it's a data type, it just happens to have these brackets on it to make it a little more uh, complex to look at. But from that point on, you're basically able to store all these values in one kind of name. So in the past, if we had five player salaries we wanted to keep track of, or five number of hits, we would have had to create a hit count one, two, three, four, like five different variables. This allows us to create one variable name and just refer to the one that we want. So normally these are involved, arrays are involved in, you know, where you have multiple, um, for our, an example, let's say, with the data we're talking about where we had multiple players and we wanted to keep track of, um, let's say, the first five that were entered. We wanted to keep track of their hits or their salary or their tier. Um, so if you, so usually looping's involved of some sort or keeping track of this index is involved because you have to know the meaning of each slot, you know, kind of if it has... Usually it's like player one, player two, player three. Five is just an example. You can make these very large, you know, in the thousands or tens of thousands. Is there a limit? There is, but I don't know. There's also a different structure called a list, which is unlimited, but it takes up more memory. Um, we'll go over that as well if we get time towards the end. But. Um, and you can use any data type. So you could have string, decimal, double. It basically would have the same format as this. This is just setting it up, initializing it. Really, when this statement's done, everything has a zero in it. I just put some values in to show you what was going on. So looks a little different here. The idea of what it's doing is a little different as far as how it stores things and um, how you refer to the value is a little different. Normally you're not referring to just this name of the entire array. Normally you're, from this point forward, you're referring to some uh, offset or index into the array. So any initial questions on that? Is it confusing? Understandable. Neither. Understandable. Okay. You guys are quiet today. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I'll stop there. We'll go through some code next time with arrays. Give me about five minutes to set up Angel for this quiz. So I would say just go down to the lab. Um, I'll open it up. Just go down to the lab and get your uh, Angel account logged into.
So we're going to talk more about Werfel, and we're going to talk about the next assignment, which is concerning um, Werfel. As we talked before, Werfel is really an extension of what we've done so far as far as server-side scripting. And we've seen this over and over with our examples. We've, we've done, and we've seen examples of how server-side scripting can take the client's request <clears throat> and do something with it. As opposed to simply having a static web page that simply responds the same to everyone, we have a server that's running a script, and that script can be in PHP or ASP.NET or whatever. For this class, we're using PHP. And <coughs> the request that comes from the client to the server includes stuff. And when we connect that server to other resources, we can start to do a lot of that stuff. These are true statements, and these aren't true only for mobile devices. This is true for anything, right? We saw how even in a desktop application, you could, um, you could um, use the IP address to figure out the location to customize it, like Google does with their search. When you enter a search term, it customizes it for your location. So the request, what does the request include? It includes a URL. It includes a bunch of stuff from the form. And it includes things such as the IP address, the user agent. And these are the things, these two things are the things that we've been focusing on because they can give us location and they can tell us something about the platform the person is using. Now, we have our own scripts that can do things, but we can also connect to other services. And we've done this through a couple of little plugins. One of them is the geolocation, or geo plugin, rather. that connects to some server somewhere and can take our IP address that comes as part of the request and give us back some information. If I was showing this more accurately, it would go like this. We use a geo plugin to connect to someone's server and take and map that IP address into location information. All right. We can do the same thing with Werfel. The difference is, is that Werfel is installed on your machine. So this is part of your server. So you're not going across the internet. And there's a Werfel database. And you can go and query that and find out information about the device. How does it do that? It does that based on the user agent. It's able to look at the user agent and identify what kind of device it is and more details about the capabilities of that device. All right. We saw an example last time where, depending on whether the device contained a phone or not, we had some different code. If the device was, in fact, a phone, we could um, create a link to actually dial the phone, as opposed to simply displaying a phone number. So we can do that by looking at the different capabilities um, in the Werfel database. Now, the one missing piece from this is sort of what we did prior to Werfel, and that is taking advantages of devices that have GPS locators to actually use the HTML5 geolocation functionality 
to get a more accurate location than the geo plug-in, and then connecting to Google Maps and the Google Maps API to draw a map. So really, these are sort of the things that we're doing. And they don't all relate specifically to mobile, but keep in mind, the mobile experience is all about not knowing what the person has on the other end. You know, do they have a tablet? Do they have a mobile phone? Do they have a flip phone? Are they working from a laptop? So all these different things taken together allow us to really customize our presentation and customize our web page. So we looked at a few examples last time where we used the Werfel database to come to some conclusions about the platform that someone was on and therefore we could show things to them and we could again show a, a, a link to a phone number instead of a phone number itself. Your next assignment is to do this. Your next assignment is to create a, and this is a two week worth assignment. So you have, um, you have some time to work on this. I want you to use Werfel to create a site that has different presentation, and different content for a desktop browser, a tablet browser, and a phone browser, mobile phone. Different presentation and different content. All right. Now, a couple of things. Let's, let's look at this and let's take inventory of the stuff that you're going to need to do this. All right. There's another catch in this. I want to have this be at least three pages big. It doesn't have to be detailed pages or anything like that, you know, just on any topic. But you should take certain measures, take some steps to prevent duplicated code. Now, first thing, let's identify. Let's identify what technologies we're going to use. Will this be static HTML pages or will this be PHP pages? Why do you say PHP? Include files to prevent redundant code. All right, there's at least a couple reasons that you could say PHP. One of them is if we want to eliminate redundant code, one good way to do that is via PHP include files. So, for example, all three of these pages are going to have the same navigation, or they ought to have the same navigation, right? Well, if, you each th if all three of the pages have, um, if all three of the pages have um, the same navigation, we don't want that duplicated in each of the three pages. We don't want that repeated in each of the three pages. Therefore, put it in a file. And where, where, where is a way that we can put a chunk of HTML code in a file that can be reused by other places? PHP and include files. What's another reason why this needs to be PHP? Any thoughts, Phil? Why would this need to be PHP? Okay. Different, different devices. Okay. Different devices. Different presentation and different content for different devices. So first of all, we need to know what kind of device it's on. Yes. Well, it'd have to be a PHP too when it reconnects to the Warful. Exactly. Too. And to extend that thinking, 
this code needs to be a dynamic, create dynamic pages, which means that the server is going to go through some process to create the pages. And part of that process is going to be to determine, is this a desktop, tablet, or mobile browser? Once you do that then, then you can write code dynamic so that you can write different content in different presentations. What do I mean when I say different content? Articles, sections. Yeah, different articles, sections, images, whatever. Different stuff on the web page. In other words, more than likely, you know, it doesn't really make sense to do it the other way around, more than likely there will be the most stuff on the desktop browser. There will be maybe the second most stuff on the tablet browser, and there'll be the least amount of stuff on the mobile phone browser. All right, why? Well, your screens are probably getting smaller as you go down in size. You are likely working with a slower connection and a less powerful processor and so on. So different content means actually different HTML stuff. All right? Different HTML stuff, different content. Now, I know I said you're going to be using PHP, right? But you remember, when I say PHP, the output of a PHP script is HTML. So your PHP code will output different HTML depending on the particular browser. And again, the fact that we've identified these three indicates to us that we have to use Warful, right? If I just said desktop versus mobile, you could use that detect mobile script that we used before. Right, because that detect mobile script was a binary, mobile, not mobile. All right, we want to go a little deeper into that, and we want more information about the capabilities, and therefore we need uh, a, a better tool. All right, different presentation. What does that mean? When I say different presentation, different content is more stuff on the page. What would different presentation mean? Yeah, it's going to look different, right? In other words, whether there's the same stuff or different stuff, when I talk about the presentation, I mean the way that it looks. What are some aspects of the way that it looks? Well, everything's an aspect of the way it looks. Everything visual. The, um, the font, the font size, the colors, background images that you use. Are things laid out in one column or in three columns? All those things are used in creating web pages that are going to have different. And we've gone over some examples. We know, as a rule, what you do when you design for a mobile phone versus for a desktop browser. You know, which one is more involved, which one's more simple and straightforward, which one would multiple columns be appropriate for, which one would single columns be appropriate for, and so on. Yes? Well, that is a good question. When I say three pages, do I mean three pages for the desktop, three pages for the mobile, and three pages for um, the tablet? I mean I want a page that, I want a mini site that has three pages associated with that I could view in these three different platforms. So, for example, if I was going to do it on the Cleveland Browns, I might have a Cleveland Browns homepage, Cleveland Browns offense page, Cleveland Browns defense page. That's my three pages. Okay. I should be able to view all three of them and get different presentation and different content on each of these browsers. Now, this is where it's up to you because you could approach this a few different ways. All right. One way you could approach it is you could actually have nine pages, right? You could have three versions of all three pages. All right? You could do it that way. Or you can do one page, you know, one version of each page, and that version is smart enough and dynamic enough to know what platform it's being displayed on, and therefore will 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 we'll get the uh, HTML, will generate the HTML and CSS appropriate for that platform. 
Are there any other things that we've studied this term that will come into play to this? Well, let me say this. First of all, you're welcome to add other stuff beyond what I talked about. So, for example, if you wanted to make your page location aware, so it, it used the geolocation plugin, you're welcome to do that, but that's not a requirement. I don't think it's a requirement. I didn't put it in. I don't think. What about responsive techniques that we studied way back the first week or so? Yeah, we probably want to do those things. All those things that we talked about, about in terms of creating flexible grids and percentage-based images and all that, that's probably still good ideas. All right? So think about those as well. So that's sort of your assignment. Now what I'm going to do today is I'm going to create a page that sort of does this. Again, I'm not going to do the whole assignment, but I'm going to build in sort of uh, and show you what approach that you could take. You could, again, you could take several different approaches. You could redirect and send people to three different folders, depending on their sort of like an extension of what we did um, with the redirect. Or you could write one set of pages that handles everyone's needs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the content, and I'm going to create, and again, this is another case of I have to put this on the web server. I have to put this on the web server because this local web server, and chances are your local web server, doesn't have Werfel installed in it. So let me go and download the example, and whatever change I make, I'm going to have to upload to the server. So I hope the server is back up and running. check that. And it is, thank goodness. All right. So let me go and pull down the example. I'll make changes to the code and then we'll go in and we'll do something with it. I showed you this example last time, and we're just going to extend it to do something a little more meaningful than just outputting what kind of device I'm on. First thing you notice, and this should be review from last time, is that we have an include once. And I include my config standard Werfel file, my, my configuration file. That file 
know you need a copy of, and it is included as one of the examples. Really, in essence, the only thing I did to customize this is I pointed to where the important workflow files live on our CIS SQL Server, and that was with lines 10 and 11. I set the path of the Wurfle directory so they can find the Wurfle files. The rest of the stuff, once you set that, goes from there. And again, you can tweak it or customize it if you want, but, um, you know, that's, that's what you got. So you need to have that. And any of your code is going to have Wurfle. All right? Now, I went and I changed this a little bit. All right. After I include it, I go in and Probably comment this line out. I'm going to try that. This is probably the more important line. I go and I grab the server variables user agent. The server variables in PHP represent stuff that came over as part of the request. For example, the IP address, the user agent, and then um, the, uh, the uh, form data and all that stuff. So I then go in and I examine different attributes of this. And in this case, I'm simply outputting the message. This is a smart TV, this is a desktop web browser, this is a tablet, this is a mobile phone, this is a mobile device. You're probably not going to want to output that. What do you think you're going to do with what you have? What do you think you're going to do with the results of these functions? Pardon me? Like, whenever we do that, we're going to direct to the styling sheet that we're going to use for our pages. Okay. We, we, yeah, we could do that. We could use the results of these, uh, of these tests to determine what style sheet we're going to use. Let's talk about some of the things we could do, and then we'll form a strategy in this particular case. We could, all right, we could use the results of these if statements to redirect the user to another page. We could do that. We could use the results of these if statements to choose what style sheet we're going to use. We could do that. We could use the results of this to choose what content to include. All right? So, all the requirements that we talked about, possibly redirecting people to another page, possibly changing the appearance via CSS, possibly include different content depending on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, I'm going to use a variable because I might want to use the test to see what kind of device is being used here in several different places in my server-side script. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to put this real early in my page. I'm going to put this before. Like anything else. I'm actually going to include it in this PHP block. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable. That says, that name is dollar sign device. So I'm going to declare that variable, var dollar sign device. 
I don't explicitly have to declare a variable in PHP, but I can. Now, what I'm going to do is, based on the results of these if statements, I'm going to set the value of that variable to something. So, if it's a smart TV, I'm going to say device equals TV. If it's a desktop browser, I'm going to set device equals desktop. If it's a tablet, I'm going to say device equals tablet. So now I have one variable that's going to take one of five different val values. Now in our case, we only have to do three different conditions. So you could tweak this a little bit. But when I'm done, I have a variable device that I could use to determine what style sheet to include, what content to include. So what I'm going to do in the body of my page is I could do this. And again, keep in mind, at this point, I'm simply demonstrating some of the capabilities that you can do. All right. I could, for example, Paragraph one, everyone gets this one, and I end my paragraph. Then, I can put in a series of if statements and have things customized for different platforms. So I could say if dollar sign device equals desktop I could have paragraph two. Desktop version. And finally, if device equals tablet, let's say, I could output paragraph two, tablet version. Okay, so let's go and let's put this up on the server so that we can play with it on different platforms.